We're looking at two verses, verse 6 and 7. <coughs> One year my friend Sean made a resolution that for a month he wouldn't eat any meat. And the next morning I bumped into him on the street and in his hand he had this huge sandwich from the butchers full of pork. <laughs> And I looked at him and I said, Sean, I thought you were going vegetarian. And he looked at me. And he looked at his sandwich. <laughs> and he looked back at me with wide eyes. And he said, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> now Christmas is over. It's that time when we start thinking about the new year and... Perhaps some of you will be making resolutions. I read a, a quote that said New Year's resolutions are just new starts to old habits. But I'm not so pessimistic. It's healthy for Christians to stop, pull our heads out of our routines, and take stock. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves. See whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. And a, a new year is a great time for that. And these two verses are going to help us prepare for 2016. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'd answer that, that prayer that we've just sung together, that in, in human words that we all understand, we would hear a voice speaking that only our spirits, enlightened by your Holy Spirit, can understand. That we would know in our hearts that the living God has been dealing with us and speaking with us this morning, and we pray for help to not just hear your voice, but to do the things that you're calling us to do. We want to have lives that reflect and glorify our Saviour. We want to be more like Him. And only you can do that work of, of changing us. So we pray, speak to us this morning. Glorify yourself as your word is preached. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you know this story, then the context of our passage of these two verses is incredibly bleak. It's marked by three D's. The first one is disobedience. The Israelites wanted a king, and Saul was the man that they wanted, but he wasn't a man after God's own heart. And in chapter 3, he acts in fear and, and haste and disobeys God. And so if you flip back to chapter 13, we read in verse 13 and 14, as Samuel the prophet speaks to him, he says, You acted foolishly. You've not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The second D is defeat. In time, Saul is going to lose his kingdom. But there's also immediate judgment. The Israelites who have rallied behind him, when they see the enemy, when they're faced with the Philistine army, they flee. Verse 6 of 13. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. The third D is degrading. Look at verse 19 and 20. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The Philistines have captured or killed every blacksmith in Israel. There's no way to get your hands on weapons. And if you need your farm equipment fixed, you've got to go down to the enemy and pay him to sharpen your plan. How embarrassing to have to go and pay your enemy to sharpen your tools. This is a low point in Israel's history. The king is disobedient, the army is defeated, and the nation is degraded. It's a hopeless situation. But Jonathan has hope. And his hope isn't in his position as a prince, nor is it in his power, even though he's a great soldier. His hope is in the mercy and might of God. Verse 6, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, 
let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. In verse 7, the armor bearer agrees. And so they go, completely dependent on God. And the result is a great victory. I was at a, a student conference and a man was preaching on this verse. And he wanted to inspire us and infuse us and encourage us. And he said, what we need is more people like Jonathan. People who will take a risk. Who will step out in faith. Who will say, perhaps the Lord. And so we all went back to our tents full of enthusiasm and zeal. But it didn't last very long. It was a bit like a New Year's resolution. You know, the, the gyms this week are going to be full. And by February they'll be pretty quiet again. And that's often our experience when we come to God's work. We're full of enthusiasm. But then Monday morning rolls around and the zeal drain. But there's a way for us to look at these verses that's going to change that. You know, if you watch a 3D movie without the glasses, you're going to be disappointed. Unless you've got the right lens, everything is going to be blurry. But when you've got that lens, it becomes clear. And the lens that we use to view this passage clearly is called typology. It says, instead of seeing Jonathan as our example to be like, see him as a reflection of the Lord Jesus. It's a poor reflection. Jesus is the, the greater Jonathan. Let's see three similarities. First of all, Jonathan had a plan. He wanted to defeat Israel's enemies and relieve their shame. Well, the Lord Jesus planned in eternity to defeat our greatest enemy, sin, death, and hell. He covenanted with the Father and the Spirit to redeem, to buy back all who are His, and to give them His righteousness and His heaven. Secondly, Jonathan acted. Even though there was no human hope of success, Jonathan put his life on the line for the nation. And at Christmas, we've just been celebrating this miracle that God's plan to save didn't stay a plan. But the Lord Jesus came into our world, even though it meant leaving behind visible divinity, exchanging heaven for, for shame and hardship and sorrow and for mockery and beatings and flogging and the horror of crucifixion. He came willingly and laid his sinless, righteous life on the line for his people. And thirdly, Jonathan had a vision. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And the Lord Jesus had a vision of the salvation that God would achieve through his death. But when the Lord Jesus tells us what that is, there's no uncertainty. There's no, perhaps, the Lord. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. If it dies, it bears much fruit. Now this is a much, much richer way to view this passage. Christ is the King's Son. Christ defeated the enemy. And Christ has the vision for the future of His Kingdom. You know there are some Christians, and perhaps you're one of them, who complains that their church leaders lack vision. To justify their criticism, they quote Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision that people perish. But what they really mean when they say the elders don't have any vision is that their vision isn't the same as your vision. That you've got ideas for what should be done about evangelistic programs and community projects. But are you paying attention to the rest of that verse? Where there's no vision, the people perish. But, it carries on. But, he that keeps the law, happy is he. That verse is saying, forget your own ideas. 
don't insist upon those. What does the Bible say? And when we look at what the Bible says, what it says, we have a vision. It's already been given to us. The Lord Jesus has given it to us. Our problem is not that we're not being inventive enough. Not that we're not cutting edge enough, but that so often our efforts to be inventive distract us from Christ's own vision for His church. Here it is, Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, that's what the Lord Jesus is doing today. Right now, He's building His church. And one day all of us will, will see it. Those of us who are Christians will be able to step back and say with John in Revelation 7, 9, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. We will praise the hero of heaven for his work of building his church. But there's somebody else to notice in this passage as well. The preacher that I heard said, be like Jonathan, I'm saying to you this morning, be like the armor bearer. Jonathan had hope and a vision. Look at how the armor bearer responds, verse 7. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Undivided loyalty. Total trust and commitment. Even when faced with the most daunting odds. The Lord Jesus has a vision for Southland. And that's where most of you have been put. Some of you have a special calling to other places. But the Lord Jesus has a vision for Southland. He's told us that he's going to build his church. And now you're being asked at the start of a new year. Are you with him? What will your response be? Can you say, I am with you, heart and soul? A man saves for, for weeks to buy his girlfriend an expensive engagement ring. And when he proposes, she sees this huge diamond and her, her face lights up. And he says, will you marry me? And she says, no. But I'll keep the ring. <laughs> When you become a Christian, you take the Lord Jesus as Saviour and Lord. You can't have heaven and reject its King. You can't be a citizen of heaven and not follow the King. You belong to Jesus now. He's your master. You were a slave to sin. Now you're a slave to righteousness. Jesus commands that all his people join him in his mission. And we're to do that with everything that we have. We're to follow the Lord Jesus. We're to say with the armor bearer, go ahead, build your church, and I am with you, heart and soul. And so that means that all of our church stuff must be geared towards mission. Let's hone in on a couple of things. First of all, participation. There's a town in England called Barrow. And an old comedian used to say, I belong to the church of Barrow, I go when I'm pushed. <laughs> Is that you, Christian? Do you need your pastor or friends nagging you to get to meeting? The Lord Jesus is building his church. How can you be built? How can you help build if you're not here? Give in. George told me a, a story, and I'm paraphrasing it now. You can see him for the, the details afterwards about a, a Scottish woman whose door was knocked on a, a wet evening by a young lady who was asking to borrow an umbrella. Well, she didn't want to give her best umbrella because she might never see it again, so she gave her a broken umbrella. The next day, a limousine pulled up at the house, and a well dressed man came to the door carrying the umbrella. And he said, The Queen would like to thank you for the loan of your umbrella. Well, the woman was, was devastated that she'd have given the Queen the second best that she'd have offered this broken umbrella. But are you content with giving to the King of Kings just the necessary, the minimum amount 
of money or time or effort. You know that when we stand before the Saviour, there will be nobody who regrets giving what they've given. Nobody will wish they'd given less. But there will be many who wish they'd given more. There are other things to think of. Service, what can I be doing for my church family? Evangelism, worship, encouragement, prayer, study. Be thinking now, Christian, how will my church life be different in 2016 for the glory of God? But then life stuff is also geared towards mission. And that's a trap we often fall into. We keep Sunday and the rest of life separate. Christ's Lordship for many of us, begins and ends at the doorstep. But Jesus didn't go to the cross for a seventh of your life. He wants you all. He wants you heart and soul. So let's get personal. Your work. The Lord Jesus would use your work for his mission. Work is a, a great opportunity to, to be a witness in a world that's obsessed with work, where work dominates lives. What a chance to be different. And so how are you running your farm? Or is the farm running you? How are you treating your employees? Those of you that have other demanding jobs, teachers, contractors, homemakers, full-time mums. Now's the time to stop and reassess. How can I use my God-given job for His glory? Your family. You know, God would use your marriage for His glory. Would use it for His mission. Are you spurring each other on? Are you finding time, good quality together time for, for reading and for prayer? Can you discuss the sermon around Sunday lunch? What a simple but a, a great place to start. How about your hobbies? I've been playing snooker in the Town and Country Club regularly for the last four months and I love it. I don't know why. <laughs> I completely understand why people find it mind-numbingly boring. But that passion is God-given. And I can use it for His glory. And so I, I play with the men on a Friday night and I invite them to church and I pray that they'll come. And you've all got hobbies that the next ten people would find boring. They just want to find them interesting. You know, model planes and trucks, fishing, tractors, art, movies, jigsaws, crochet, board games. God would use these things for the building of his church. So be thinking, how can I turn that passion into mission? How can I use this to get along like-minded people who also enjoy these things and then bring them to hear the good news, share something in my life and my words of my saviour. One final question before we draw to a close. I made you a big promise. How does seeing the passage this way keep our enthusiasm and zeal up? You see, if we are Jonathan, if that's us, well then when we stumble, and when we fall, the mission ends too. You understand that? If Jonathan had slipped climbing up that brick wall, <coughs> game over. And if we are a Jonathan, then when things go wrong, when we wonder, when we stray from the Lord Jesus, the mission collapses. But if Jesus is the greater Jonathan, well then the mission never <coughs> fails. And even when we fall, our confidence can't be broken. Our joy is still complete because Christ marches on. He's always leading, always bringing down established enemies, always building his church, always defying the gates of hell, always ready to pull us back to our feet when we've stumbled and reignite our flickering zeal. And so I'm saying to you, if you start well today, but have nothing in the tank by February, or even Friday, the 
the mission carries on and smouldering wicks can be reignited and bruised reeds can be propped up in the grace of the Saviour and caused to grow and flower again. <coughs> I saw a sermon titled, Nothing is on this verse, on these verses. It, this was the title. Nothing can stop God from building his kingdom except us. I'm so glad that's unbiblical rubbish. So glad that that's utter rubbish. As if you and I could even delay the plans and purposes of an omnipotent God. And now you need to think about that seriously if you're not a Christian. Because the Lord Jesus is building his church. And a day is coming when he will return in glory. And everyone will bow before him and he will gather his people from every nation on earth. For them it will be a day of joy, but for his enemies of fear, judgment and hell. Nothing can stop that from happening because the mission isn't resting on our shoulders. It is more certain than tomorrow. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Jesus is building his church today. The gates of heaven are open. He's bringing people into his kingdom. This morning he welcomes sinners who will repent and believe on him. Won't you come and surrender heart and soul to Jesus Christ? He alone can take away your sin. He alone can make you ready to face that judgment. He alone can lead you victoriously to heaven. Let's pray. Father, we, we pray as we face a new year that this year, with all its difficulties and challenges and hardships that will undoubtedly come, with its good times and bad times, will nonetheless be a year of spiritual growth for your people a growth for your kingdom in Southland. We pray, mighty God, that in our churches, all the churches that are represented here, and churches that have buildings, churches that will just be meeting us in people's houses in, in Asia, Father, we pray that it will be a, a time of your kingdom coming into our world. We pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you would be vindicated, lifted up and seen as beautiful, worthy and glorious. We pray that in Wyndham and in Gore, in Christchurch, China. Draw hearts, draw people to yourself. Give that gift of faith that we might surrender everything to you. To say, those of us who are Christians, I am with you in this church building heart and soul. To say, those of us who aren't Christians, I need you, Lord Jesus. And I'm resting on you, relying on you, with you, heart and soul. Oh, we pray for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.